Okay, so uh, let's make a start. We've got quite a, quite a few of the online people. So, um, yeah, just morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to BDO's annual betting and gaming um, seminar. For those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Ollie Chinook. So I'm the head of betting and gaming at BDO. Uh, fairly new to this role. Uh, I took over from uh, Kieran Storen, who retired uh, back at the end of September. He did actually say he was going to come today and terrorise me. Uh, he hasn't, hasn't, hasn't arrived uh, as of yet. Um, he did have an incredible number of leaving dues, actually. So <laughs> a miracle. If anybody did miss one of those leaving dues, then please do, uh, please do get in contact with him. I'm sure he'll be happy to uh, arrange some more. Um, but just on a slightly serious note, and I did actually make him cry at one of his leaving dues as well, actually, with my nice emotional speech about him. But um, he has done a lot for, for BDO and for, for, for me personally. Um, and I think from certainly when we attended a number of the leaving events, uh, you know, there was a lot of well wishes, a lot of messages there. And I think he's been fairly pivotal uh, to the online gaming sector in terms of from an advisory angle over the years. So um, I did just want to pass on my, my thanks to him sort of publicly there. Um, one of the things that he hasn't done very well for the online gaming industry, however, is that uh, uh, one of his traditions at these seminars is that he always tells his Christmas cracker jokes. <laughs> um, and I was going to drop this and did hope it would go with his retirement, but I have been encouraged both internally <laughs> and externally to consider this. So I do apologise. So here's, here goes with my two Christmas cracker jokes. Um, so what do you call a beehive without an exit? Unbelievable. <laughs> and I was in a job interview the other day, I was doing a job interview, um, and I asked the candidate if they could perform under pressure, and they said no, but I can do Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> Is that here and here? <laughs> 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 proud of those two, I'm sure. Um, so just, just very quickly in terms of... Uh, in terms of agenda uh, for today, so um, I'll kick us off with a um, uh, short bit just generally around our insights and our view of the um, sort of sector performance in the year. Uh, and then I'll move on to give a bit of a high level update to sort of accounting and uh, reporting developments in the period. Um, again, apologies, but we're in a, there's an abundance of colleagues today. <laughs> Uh, presenting. So I'll then hand over to um, Bobby Woodward, who will give a bit of an m &A, uh, activity update and again just some of the insights from us around a, a diligence perspective. Um, we'll then hand over to uh, Ollie Back uh, and Rob Wild, who um, will just slightly new slot this year, something we haven't done before, but just to give some insights to what we're seeing around sort of the commercial risk management side uh, and certainly just a few things that can be I suppose looked at um, as we head into as we head into 2024. Um, shortly before the break, uh, we've got Fiona and Vlad who will just sort of again give some further um, insights as to where you're seeing from a responsible gambling and AML perspective impacting the sector. And then after the break, it's uh, it's all things tax. So we've got Daisy on the corporate side, um, some 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 reminders and, and new bits on the transfer pricing side, uh, and then also some R and D uh, pieces from Carrie. Uh, and then finally there, uh, we'll have to raise just uh, updates from uh, on the indirect taxes. Uh, we should be done, as I say, broadly by about, about midday. And then we've got, for those uh, for those in the room, we've got some sandwiches and stuff, stuff afterwards. And I think most of the presenters will be around uh, if you do have questions. Um, just in terms of the people uh, watching us online, again, if you do have questions, please do put them in the chat. Uh, we will be monitoring monitoring that, and we can put those to the uh, to the presenters. Okay, so uh, a bit around the sort of performance in the period, and um, I did check before, but we're, we're pretty sure this is our twentieth year of running these uh, running our sort of annual annual seminar. Um, and I think it's fair to say each year when you reflect on what's happened in the online gaming industry, it's a pretty uh, it's pretty amazing to look back and look at the level of activity uh, that, that, that's going on. Um, you know, I think despite this year, the sort of slightly depressed uh, sort of capital market and debt market positions, you know, we are we have seen a flurry of, uh, of transactions uh, of late. Um, you know, we continue to see taxation, taxation changes and impacts on the sector. Uh, and then there's also the regulatory side. Um, and, you know, that's both from a 
uh, challenges perspective, but but also um, also providing some opportunities. So, you know, the US is a good example, and then clearly the latest news on on Brazil uh, in terms of how that's developing from a from a regulator perspective. Um, so in those 20 years or so, um, for a number of those, we've supported uh, EGR, so the industry uh, industry trade magazine, uh, just with um, one of their Power 50 rankings, and it was published just before <coughs> Christmas. Uh, and for those of you that don't don't know, it's uh, essentially EGR rank the top 50 uh, B2C online uh, online operators. Um, and we play a part in that by producing what's called sort of their, their financial score or their financial ranking. Um, and we look at that from three angles. So that's uh, sort of NGR or revenue, revenue position, uh, EBITDA, adjusted EBITDA, uh, and then market capitalization or some sort of implied valuation from, a, uh, from those private businesses. And we combine all of those together on various, various metrics to produce a financial score. Um, but what that does give us also is a bit of insight to some of the some of the numbers from those from those um, those Power 50. Uh, it is all done on a confidential basis, um, but we thought it'd be quite interesting. We've done this for the last couple of years and just uh, sort of putting these together to show you how we see the industry uh, developing and performing in the year. Um, again, another Kieran legacy, but bagpipe is betting and gaming performance in period EGR. So look at it now. <laughs> Oh, clearly, we have to try and create the word out of it. Um, but I think, you know, despite uh, the sort of partly saturated market and the challenges in the UK market and also certain European uh, countries, you know, I think we're still seeing um, in those sort of power 50 a 20% growth in NGR, uh, NGR in the year. Um, and that's predominantly coming, I think, from sort of US growth, uh, a little bit of LATAM growth, particularly Brazil, uh, Mexico. Uh, Canada, following some sort of legislation and regulation there, and then pockets, certain pockets of, of Africa as well. Um, and I think that's largely dependent on, on how businesses are able to sort of get the payment process working there, which has been one of the challenges we've seen um, over the last few years. But I think just maybe a bit of perspective as well, you know, and I put the five year, five year growth on here, but I think you struggle to find another industry that's, that's shown this level of growth year on year over that sustained over that sustained period, um, you know, so that is a pretty phenomenal performance, I think, overall from the from from the sector. Where is it going to go in 2024? Again, personal views, but I think we will see. I think there will still still continue to be see some growth there. Whether we, whether there's a bit of a softening at that 20% level, um, I think time will tell. Uh, clearly, the, you know, the US, some of these more pockets in in Africa that we're that we're seeing. Um, as well as you know, potential impacts of, of, of regulating in Brazil, I think we're still going to continue to see some continue to see some growth there. So, in terms of how that pulls through to sort of the EBITDA uh, EBITDA position, again, it is seeing some growth there. Um, the growth is slightly softer than also the 20% top line that we saw. So, broadly around 15% EBITDA growth across that across that power 50. Um, and clearly, you know, again, we'll be well aware of some of the sort of the, the costs of, 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 of sort of growing your revenue in your top line in the US, um, sort of eating into that margin uh, and continuing you know, regulatory changes as well. Um, so, uh, for example, the, the German German tax that's come in in the uh, or came in, in in the year, I should say, or came in, in the prior year, sorry. So I should say this is to 12 months to June, so it's not the not the full year, but but fairly representative of, of, of where we're going there. But again, a um, bit of recovery as well off the back of 2022, where we did see you know, the tail of COVID. We saw much higher operating costs um, due to various like, sort of economic economic matters and stuff. But again, it's still pretty phenomenal growth for the for the industry. I think there's two that I'm sort of quite interested in watching uh, this year, actually. So that's um, be interesting to see how MGM progress in the UK market. That's an interesting one to watch. And secondly, from a US market perspective, um, I think ESPN bet is the one that I'm sort of just keeping an eye on, really. Just partly out of some of these media media hookups and stuff as well, just to see how they uh, how they get on. And clearly, what's a very very competitive uh, very competitive market. OK, so that was sort of a bit about sort of performance in the period. And um, now I'm just going to move on to uh, cover some of the sort of accounting developments. And apologies, some of this is a little bit small on the screen, but we will we will send the slides round. Uh, we will send the slides round after. 
um, and a number of these have got click through links in them as well. So if you want further detail, you can go into you can go into that. And um, I think it, I think we continue to see a lot of sort of activity from the standard setters, um, both from accounting, financial reporting, and also sort of climate change uh, side of things. Um, I, I would say that it, at the, for this year, there's no sort of big, significant, very pervasive changes, but certainly as we look forward uh, over the next three, four, five years, there are some quite big changes that are potentially uh, due, to, due to come in. Um, so what I'll probably just do now is just give you some high level, um, high level on some of these uh, areas. And again, there is some fairly niche bits here, but if it's specific to your business or recognise that's something that your business has done, then um, obviously you can dive into it in a bit more detail. Uh, just one quick plug as well. We do run quarterly sort of online uh, IFRS UK GAP training seminars as well, um, and we'll, we'll send the link around for that again when we when we send out the slides. Um, so in terms of sort of new new effective standards and amendments for that are going to be effective for December year ends here. Um, again, fairly fairly niche bits, but there are a few bits where people may be caught. So. The first one is on IFRS 17, which is a new insurance um, standard. On the face of it, shouldn't really affect the online uh, gambling industry, but you occasionally get these sort of unintended consequences of it. So IFRS 17 replaced IFRS 4, um, which is the insurance standard. And the relevant point here is around what's called a financial guarantee uh, contract. And the best example I can give is if you have a parent company or a subsidiary company that's providing a cost guarantee to uh, whichever company is holding the banking arrangements. Um, previously, under Argus 4, you could assess that and say, well, are they going to default or not? Um, it was a fairly quick, quick test. Um, IFRS 17 doesn't give you that option. So actually, you have to look at it slightly differently and say, well, what's my percentage risk of default uh, on that loan? And if if you see there is a small percentage risk there, technically you should be booking some sort of liability and that company is providing the cost guarantee. As I say, unintended consequences, but um, what tends to happen at the moment is that companies will put in their provision note or their contingent liability note that they have this cost guarantee. I do expect the regulators, partly because it's a new standard, when they're doing their accounts reviews to look at some of these areas. So it's just a, it's a small thing to think about, but it's, as I say, unintended consequence of the uh, of that new standard. Um, I'll touch a bit more on the IFRS IS1 uh, changes and the ISA changes in, in, in a couple of further slides, uh, but just on the tax side, a um, couple of changes to IS12. So uh, again, this is just one to watch. If you do have um, overseas uh, leases, uh, balance sheet leases, then you just need to um, make sure you're looking at the deferred tax position on those. Again, it's quite a niche area and quite a technical area, um, but that's just something to flag there. And um, amongst all of the pillar two noise, which days will cover, cover slightly later on, there is one piece of little good news um, in that. So what IS12 has said is that um, if you are uh, operating in jurisdictions where you don't have the 15% uh, tax rate, uh, whilst you have to, and, and then you do have tax sensitive items, um, uh, it, whilst you have to look at the current tax accounting, you can ignore anything around that from a deferred tax perspective. So that is one helpful thing that's actually been clarified around, um, around that. Uh, in terms of looking forward, again, there's not, not masses there, but um, on the IS1, again, just, just to say that there was the exposure draft that came out, and we probably would have commented on it last year. Um, it potentially have some consequences for where you had uh, potential breach of risk on covenants, etc. I've actually dialed that back down now. Um, so, to be honest, there's not a great deal in this standard other than pushing a bit more, a bit more disclosure around covenants. Um, again, slightly niche point, but if you have any convertible debt, uh, debt positions, um, there is some slightly niche rules that you might be caught on here. So that's that's worth looking at. Um, and finally, if anyone does any supplier financing or first factoring arrangements, then there's some clarifications from IS7 around what you have to do from a disclosure perspective, just to just to watch out for. Okay, um, 
I mentioned, uh, say, one of the points I had in there was just sort of bias one and change there. Again, this is a little bit of tinkering around the edges, but I do expect it's something that the regulators will be will be will be focusing on. Um, what what the changes to the standard and the, and the practice statement do is trying to force you um, to be where, where you have an accounting policy, which is you know, could be deemed to be complex or judgmental, is to give much more detail as to that policy. And they're trying to avoid the boilerplate um, standard IFRS disclosures, really, uh, in your accounting policies. Um, that, that said, what the standard is sort of suggesting is actually we can remove some of those accounting <coughs> policies. In practice, we don't really see people, we don't expect people to really be doing that, but where the focus will be is really on where you do have some element of judgment, etc., then you should be drilling down and you should be giving more, more detail in those policies. Um, again, it's a bit of a nuance on, on wording, but they changed it from significant accounting policies to material accounting policies. I mean, it's, it's partly splitting hairs a little bit, but these are some of the areas where they're saying, actually, if you have things like a change in accounting policy, more than one accounting policy choice, um, or you're combining a number of standards together to reach an accounting assessment, then it's really trying to, trying to force you to dive into much more detail uh, as to what you have done there. OK, um, again, so, um, few bit of activity from IFRIC this year. So IFRIC is the International Financial Reporting Interpretations Committee. So essentially, if something comes up um, and someone questions something, then they'll, they'll give an interpretation. And again, these are all fairly, fairly niche areas. So I wasn't going to try and, try and go into detail on some of these. Um, but as I say, if you have seen or do impact, do have a, something like this in the business in the year, then it's worth, worth looking at these specifically. OK, um, so looking ahead then, and as I said, this is where I do think there is actually going to be quite a bit of impact um, for, for businesses, but I think it is quite a, quite a, way, quite a way out. Um, so uh, the new standard, which, which everyone expects to be called IFRS 18, um, hasn't been named yet, but that's what we think, it's going to, it's going to replace this IS1, uh, which is the presentation of financial statements. And this is, as I say, it's going to have quite a pervasive impact. Um, uh, really on the income statement, cash flow statement, and also on um, alternative performance measures or management performance measures. And um, what, what's caused this is uh, investors and users of accounts essentially saying they're struggling to compare companies across across the sector because everybody is using different measurement metrics, so adjusted operating profit, adjusted profit, EBITDA, or adjusted EBITDA. Um, and whilst they're not restricting the use of those per se, they're mandating certain P&L descriptors. So everyone will have to have an operating profit disclosure. Everybody will have to have profit before uh, interest and tax, tax disclosure as well. And then combined with that, again, different people have different definitions of what operating profit entails. And so again, there's going to be much more um, guidance and rules around what you can can and can't put in uh, in operating. So it's going to be a bit more prescriptive um, than, it, than, than it used to be. Um, around uh, management performance measures, so the issue they've seen there is that um, people are using, businesses are using uh, measures in the front end of their financial statements, which aren't necessarily fully audited or fully auditable in the back end of the financial statement, so in the notes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So really what they're doing is they're forcing uh, forcing the additional disclosure, additional description as to, as to what those performance measures are, what the adjustments are, et cetera. I think, to be honest, a number of businesses have been doing, have been doing this um, and are giving reasons as to why they're adjusting items, et cetera, but this just formalizes it into our rest a, bit, a little bit better. If you have got, if you are in US reporters, um, you may well know there's there's lots of challenge around what EBITDA is, what adjusted EBITDA is, and again, this might cause a little bit of conflict there, and does need to be does need to be worked through. And um, second one I just flag on here is is, this, is the IFRS nine point, and again, this has been part of a tentative uh, IFRIC uh, decision, and this is basically it sounds sounds a bit odd when you say it, but when is cash cash? 
Um, and that the key point, I think, for the online uh, and gaming sector is payment processes. So, um, uh, and, and where this IFRIT may be going, don't quite know when it may be effective yet, is to say actually if you've got a payment processor balance, a traditional payment process balance that's clearing on three, four day terms, um, at the moment some businesses are classifying that as, as cash. Um, where the standard's going is until that's sort of under your control in your own banking system, um, then that potentially shouldn't, shouldn't be cash. Um, this did come out originally a couple of years back and you saw the likes of M&S, for example, who did some enormous restatements to move anything that was in their tax system. They moved it out of cash and pushed that back into uh, a receivable. So that, that could be for some classifying payment receivables as cash, um, uh, a potential change there. And um, the final point on, on here is, again, a bit of, bit of good news, I think. Um, so at the moment, for uh, if you're a non-UK business and you're under IFRS as a subsidiary of a, of a, of a, of a listed parent or parent company, um, you still have to comply with full IFRS requirements. So what this is what this is saying is that there's going to be a reduced disclosure framework. Um, those of you operating in the UK may know that we have already have a reduced disclosure framework, which most businesses uh, tend to adopt. Um, <clears throat> Um, yeah, so most businesses tend to, tend, tend to adopt that, but this is just potentially giving the option. So, for example, if you have multiple subsidiaries in Malta and you have to do 60 page accounts for, for fairly small businesses, this might give you a bit of option there. Um, that said, you know, certainly from that there are certain local regulators, so gaming regulator requirements around those accounts. So it is a bit of a bit of a balance of it. Um, and we'll have to wait and see because it is also different to what you can do in the UK from a reduced disclosure perspective. So we could end up with sort of three, three different frameworks, unfortunately. Um, and UK gap. So just just quickly on this, and this is probably a very this is actually quite a large change, uh, not expected before 2026. But um, for those of you familiar with uh, IFRS, um, what what the financial so it's called FRED 82 financial reporting exposure draft. This aligns the requirements of IFRS 15, which is around revenue, and IFRS 16 around leases with what you have to do from an IFRS perspective. So mm -hmm. on the revenue side, not expecting um, uh, significant change for the B2C operators, but from a B2B perspective, you know, you could start seeing a few differences there. And so it's worth having some planning for that. Um, the leasing side will definitely impact a lot of UK GAP operators, and, and this will then this will mean that all your operating leases that you hold will come onto balance sheet as a corresponding right of use asset and a liability. As I said, 2026 is the is the expected date, um, but that should give sufficient time for planning, etc. But it, especially if you're holding a lot of leases in a lot of different countries, it can be quite an onerous process. So it's worth starting to plan for that early. Um, the FRC uh, every year review a number of um, accounts for, for, for public companies and large companies, um, and they've issued their sort of top ten list of things that they uh, that they that they sort of didn't really like. I suppose is the point in um, in their reviews. Um, just quickly on the top three there, so we did see with the sort of changing economic climate, we did see quite a few impairments come through. Um, I think the messaging there really is around full disclosure. In, around inputs and assumptions. Um, <clears throat> on the uh, on the judgments and estimates side, I think this is what the um, this is what the new standard is trying to trying to capture here. So again, just more and more disclosure around sensitivities, judgments, etc. And um, finally, in that top three was cash flow statements. Um, they did actually say the cash flow statements was the biggest source of restatements of accounts um, for public companies in the UK. And actually the PCOB actually yesterday as well, recently as well, have said that's the biggest source of adjustments in US accounts as well. So um, I think it's just the messaging there is really around, well, firstly, it appears that they're pretty too, the rules are probably too complex. I mean, they probably seems to be getting it wrong, um, but really around just a pre-issuance review there and making sure it's been a robust review. Um, and then just finally on the climate and sustainability reporting, um, for the first time 
obviously this came in as mandatory for, for public companies uh, last year. There's various rules coming in for EU listed businesses um, for uh, next year, 2024. But in the UK for 2023 year end, if you've got AIM companies with more than 500 employees, or you've got private businesses with more than 500 employees or 500 million and 500 million in revenue, sorry, then there are increased uh, climate reporting requirements. Um, and again, just one little niche point, just, just to be aware of, if you do have a listed um, parent that's non-UK or a non-UK top toe, um, even if they are adhering to the requirements there, the climate reporting requirements, you, you, you may not or you probably won't get a exemption in your subsidiary. So it's just one point to make sure that you're not, not caught on that. OK, so appreciate that was fairly high level and fairly rushed through. There is a lot, there is, I say, there is a lot, lot going on. So I just tried to touch on uh, sort of high level points. But if there is anything, then um, please do, please do get in contact with us. I'm happy to, happy to have a look at it. OK, so I'll hand over to Ollie now. Thank you. Good uh, morning, everyone. I'm Ollie Woodward, uh, director in our transaction services team in London. And today I'm going to be talking to you about some of the M&A activity that we've seen in the sector this year. Um, and in setting this out, I think um, I decided we need to sort of address some of the challenges that we've seen in the market um, to understand some of the opportunities that have arisen and drivers of M&A. And uh, Oli already, uh, Oli C touched on some of the macroeconomic pressures, the geopolitical risk that we've seen. And obviously the, the gaming sector is not resistant to that, um, but we still have seen a good base level of M&A activity in the year. Um, but the reality is what we've seen on transactions is that they've been a little bit more stop start in nature, um, being kicked down the road maybe to a time where people think there might be some more stability. And also, um, uh, buyers sort of playing, um, prospective buyers playing off each other to try and drive down uh, valuations. Um, and what, what that really has left us with is uh, well, the deals that we see getting done are focused more on quality, not quantity. Um, and uh, the, the targets that have been acquired tend to be high performing in nature or fit a certain strategic need. And, and I'll come on to talk about some of those. Uh, in due course. Um, and, and actually on the strategy point, we have seen a lot of businesses announce strategic reviews, uh, the likes of Kindred, uh, IGT, eBet, Catena Media. Um, and what that lends itself to, do, uh, to is sort of vendor due diligence exercises as those strategies get reviewed. Um, and as the cost of borrowing has gone up, uh, there's also a bit more scrutiny around financing. And we've seen quite a lot of pre-financing uh, DD, and indeed we were involved um, in, in Playtex sort of three million uh, bond raise earlier in 2023. Um, so um, it's fair to say it has been a challenging year for, for listed businesses, and um, there's been pretty much little to no IPO activity. And I'll come and talk a bit about the outlook on that later. Um, and a lot have seen share price declines. Um, that have been accompanied with you know, profit downgrades in some instances. But, but actually, when we see some lower valuations, lower multiples in the market, it does also galvanise a bit of M&A activity. And probably the most obvious example of that is 888, which I think at one point its share price was 80% down on its peak in 2021. And obviously, reportedly, it was subject to numerous wins during the year. Um, but it is, it's a double edged sword when we have lower share prices, lower multiples, um, you can get a bit of a disparity between the buyer and seller over to what is a fair price. Um, and it can complicate deals, especially at that step, that negotiation stage. Um, on the re regulatory side, we've obviously had the UK gambling white paper. Um, and really what, what this is getting businesses to do is look at their strategies going forward. Um, in, in particular in the UK, obviously on the online side around player protection, on the land-based side, there's been some easing of those restrictions. But really from a growth perspective, it has businesses looking elsewhere for growth opportunities. Um, and in Europe, that has seen a lot of acquisitions of what we call these local heroes, <laughs> incumbents who have already established a good market share 
and operators coming in and buying them for that first mover advantage. So, you know, we had Entain completing their deal with Bet City in the Netherlands and acquiring STS in Poland. You had uh, Betson acquiring uh, Bet First in Belgium and Flutter um, making an investment in MaxBet, uh, which is primarily Serbian focused. So um, there was a lot of that activity during 2023, but also the consolidation piece. Uh, probably the most high profile uh, deal was Lotomatica's acquisition of SKS 365, which reportedly was um, quite a highly contested target. Um, so yeah, again, we still see a lot of activity in, in those established markets as well. Um, going across to North America, which obviously we have to talk about the US and Canada, before I mention some of the deals in that space, um, there have been challenges for some, and part of that is due to the slower than expected opening up of certain states, which means that the path to profitability is maybe longer. Um, and we have seen examples of some of the, some operators pulling out of North America altogether, the like of Foxbet and Kindred during 2023. And really what this does is it plays into the hands of the, the bigger players. And, um, you know, the fan jewel DraftKings duopoly continues to rumble on, I think, over 70% market share in the sportsbook world. Um, but as Oli C referred to, there are some new challenges arising, and that is primarily through M&A. And um, we had ESPN bet combining with Penn. Um, Fanatics also made a large acquisition um, as well. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out, in particular, this, this model of uh, media businesses combining with existing uh, gambling businesses. Um, over on the in the affiliate world, there was actually quite a lot of offloading of affiliate assets during the year, um, and this is as those affiliate businesses look to sort of realign their strategies, focusing primarily on US, Latin, Africa, um, and the biggest beneficiaries of that were probably Better Collective, who acquired I think six uh, affiliate businesses during the year, including Playmaker Capital, probably being the most high profile of those. Um, and whilst we're on LATAM in Africa, um, as, the, as the onset of regulation comes, um, we're seeing a lot of M&A interest, you know, with, with that first mover advantage being the opportunity there. Um, and further to sort of, you know, Brazil's been mentioned, there's some deals involved in Colombia, um, and we expect some others uh, also in, on, in Africa as well. I think there was um, the Wonder Labs acquisition in South, South Africa as well during the year. So um, what I've just got on screen here, and you may, may not be able to see the detail, but is some of those larger deals that we saw in that sort of 100 million plus price bracket. And I think I've touched on, on most of these already when going through the themes, but just to pull out a few other things that we've seen, um, there continues to be quite a lot of interest in the lottery, the lottery space. Um, and, you know, we had FDJ, Foreign Premier, Lotteries Ireland, um, and there was Allwin acquiring Camelot Lottery Solutions, um, and also um, more recently, and whilst they're not they're not on here because they haven't crystallised yet, quite a lot of B two B activity of late. Um, it's sort of leading up to COVID a few years back. We did have a big flurry of B two B focused deals, and that's either um, you know operators looking to bring development capability in house but also private equity interest. Um, so that is probably one thing we're going to expect to see going into 2024, um, a bit more B2B activity. Um, and finally, I wanted to cover um, some market insights and some outlooks for 2024. So uh, as I previously mentioned, sort of buyers are taking a more cautionary approach to PD at the moment. And, um, Part of that is we're seeing a lot of earnouts being structured um, in, in deals. Um, and the reason is this obviously brings a mitigation against valuation risk, which, which we touched on when we're, when, when we're trying to agree prices. Um, but the, what we're seeing in the trends of late is that the actual portion that is attributed to the earnout can sometimes be much bigger than the initial purchase consideration and have milestones going out three, four, five years. Um, and aside from obviously the other off route, which is offering shares, this does have the ability to complicate deals um, because obviously there are implications of earnouts post-transaction, both from operational and 
and financial perspective. So I think that what we'd be saying is when, when you're entering into those negotiations, discussions, it is something that sellers need to be prepared for. Um, looking ahead to 2024, uh, I touched on already around the UK gambling and white paper. We're going to have those consultation, consultations and eventual requirements. And really, it will be interesting to see um, as that maybe gives a bit more transparency and a, and a level playing field, what that, that makes UK operators think about their longer term strategies. And there may be a knock on effect with <coughs> M&A. Um, similarly, um, with the UK and, and US elections, um, there's likely to be some change around those and maybe the, the pinch point of the elections, there'll be a bit more of a wait and see approach. But we've already had some, you know, suggestions from uh, Jeremy Hunt around gambling duty and going up to, you know, 21% across the board. So it will be interesting to see how they, they play out and what it means for, for operators and their strategies. Um, we've already touched a few times on those growth markets, but I think we're going to continue to see acquisitions, especially in the jurisdictions that are newly regulated in, in these regions, North America, um, Eastern Europe as well, um, Latin and Africa. So continuing to see a lot of interest in, in those regions. Just touching on technology and AI, um, that dominated the landscape in 2023 and we expect it will continue in 2024. I think what will be interesting is to see if there are more of these bolt-ons where operators are looking to bring in some of that those AI capabilities in-house. And that's both from a sort of player interaction uh, perspective, but also responsible gaming and where improvements can be made when, when AI is used. And finally, I'll leave you with some cautious optimism over the return to capital markets. Um, you know, Clearly, we've seen a bit of sta stabilisation of, of inflation and interest rates of late, and there is a lot of pent-up investment demand, um, you know, across the board, and 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 mm. almost a few of businesses who are at least considering the IPO route. So, um, both in the UK but also in the US, um, probably you know the most high-profile first one is going to be Flutter, who have announced that they're you know they're going to be listing in, in, on the New York Stock Exchange later this month. And it will be interesting to see if, if others follow suit. So that's uh, sort of my whistle stop tour, um, but I'll be around later if anyone wants to chat through um, anything that I've discussed or otherwise. And I'll, uh, I'll hand over to uh, another Oliver and also Robert talk about commercial risk management. Morning, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, as, as Ollie said, I'm another Ollie. I think I'm the last Ollie today. I'm joined by my colleague Rob Wild. Uh, so my name's Ollie Back. Um, I'm a partner uh, within this London office here, but I um, head up our what's called our commercial advisory practice um, nationally. Um, I'll come on to what that means and what we do shortly uh, in a moment. Um, but as I said, I'm joined by my colleague Rob Wilds, who I'll, I'll kind of get to introduce himself shortly. Uh, but we'll basically just be spending the next ten or so minutes. Firstly, talking about what we do as, a, as an organisation, but hopefully more interest to you all is what we're currently seeing from, from other clients, not just in this sector, but across all sectors, which may well resonate with you all. And, and, and if so, what are some of the solutions to those? Uh, so I've been with the firm for about four years now. Uh, prior to that, I was with PwC for about 13 or 14 years uh, and did a, a few years at EY as well. Um, and as I said, I lead up the, the commercial advisory practice, which essentially just helps clients to manage their third party risk and ultimately drive better outcomes from their, their third party relationships, predominantly on the supply chain side. Um, so, Rob, do you want to give a quick uh, overview of yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm Rob Wilds. I've joined from 1st of August. So in Ollie's team to um, head up the procurement consulting. So this is helping all our mid-market and large enterprise uh, clients with um, procurement and um, cost savings and indirect uh, cost bases as well. Great. Thanks, Ross. <laughs> um, so I, I don't want to spend too much time explaining what we do. Um, if it's of interest to any of you, we'd be very happy to have a follow-on conversation. Uh, but as I said, it, it, at its highest level, we help clients to manage their third party risk and drive better outcomes from, from uh, their, their contracted relationships. Uh, what we've got there is essentially our, our supplier and, and contract management framework. Um, I mean, just to, to highlight this, if you've got a robust 
uh, function which covers and links together all of those key areas, you'll be doing better than about 95% of, of organisations. Um, just to bring that to life from a, a cost and value point of view, uh, World Commerce and Contracting, uh, which is the, generally the recognised um, industry body for contract management, uh, every year they survey about 500 businesses um, to, to evaluate contract management and supply management capabilities. Um, this year, uh, sorry, in 2023, they dropped their figures um, a couple of months ago, and they basically identified that on average, businesses lose about 8.6% uh, in terms of value and cost through cost leakage from the beginning to the end of the contract. Um, so obviously getting this right, particularly in the current macroeconomic environment, can be a really useful lead to pull. Um, right, Rob, do you want to just kind of bring yeah. together some of those case supply chain themes which we're seeing at the moment? Yeah, so these are some of the, the key themes we've picked out in supply chain. Um, they will impact your sector, but um, they're quite pervasive across other sectors as well. So the, the first one is really the sort of the, the, the trading conditions and the macroeconomic and geopolitical uncertainty at the moment. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing this um, generate an inflationary environment and that results in price increases in the indirect cost base. So. So for you know IT and telecoms heavy businesses, you're going to see that push from your your third party suppliers in terms of price points. Um, you know we don't we we're seeing that um, that st instability is continuing. You know we're seeing news today even with the the um, the airstrikes in Yemen. So so we we, we expect that to continue. Um, Number two, there is supply chain risk. So, you know, historically, the management of supply chain risk was sort of good practice. It was a hygiene factor. But what we're seeing is they, those risks are becoming issues and, and they're, they're really playing out. So what that means is, you know, it means the, the, the collapse of suppliers. It means the delays with delivery. It means disruption in the supply chain, you know, outbreaks of COVID and logistics. All these issues have to be a lot more actively managed in the supply chain. So where you have major strategic outsource deals, you know, a, a more active management of that supply chain risk is needed. Where you're, if you have a dependency there on the, on the third party supplier, so that that we're really seeing that come to come to the fore, fore and we see that as a, as a major trend at the moment. In terms of procurement, then, if you have a procurement team, whether that be small or large. Um, you know the expectations on procurement are increasing so you know in, in this environment the focus will be on price and, and driving costs out but equally they're still expected to deliver against csr and sustainability people goals and brands and so there, there, there's that sort of balanced scorecard approach so you know what as as sustainability will continue to be a major trend and, and procurement has to continue to deliver against all those different outcomes as well as the core outcomes of quality, risk and price. So their jobs are becoming more challenging, um, not less, I would say, at the moment. Um, and the final one is, is, of course, value for money. You know, cost of living crisis, all, all our B2B and B2C um, clients are experiencing this. They expect, you know, the customers are demanding value for money. And what that is resulting in is businesses driving very strategic savings programmes. So we're, we're seeing this um, being quite publicly announced. So ma major UK companies are making a point that they're delivering very large savings programmes to be more efficient, which means they can deliver more value to their, their customer bases. So, so we're, we're seeing these themes at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it, it's a quite a challenging environment um, in, the, in the supply chain and managing third party suppliers. Great. And, and before I um, kind of bring to life some kind of current case studies and, and client examples that we're currently working on, um, please feel free to just to jump into questions. So if you've if you've got any, just stick your hand up or shout out. Be be very willing to answer them. Um, and just hopefully to, to bring to life some of the the points that Rob and I have been making so far. Um, these are our live examples of where we're currently working with clients in this space. Uh, so the one up here in the top left, um, we've been working with the FTSE 5 now, we're entering our fifth year now. Um, they essentially came to us just before the COVID pandemic kicked off uh, because they had a business critical supplier uh, which, which failed. 
um, and their, their supply management process and, and governance structures hadn't raised any red flags. So it came up completely out of the blue. Um, it wasn't one of the major um, uh, suppliers with regards to volume and value, uh, but actually in terms of the criticality of their end-to-end -end production line, it, it caused a huge amount of issues. So they came to us to basically um, uh, provide deep dives on their top tranche of, of high-risk uh, suppliers on an annual basis. So we do about 25 or 30 uh, supplier deep dives every year, um, essentially firstly looking into how resilient is that organisation from a financial standpoint, uh, so we will uh, look into not only their financial statements, uh, but also their group financial statements to identify liquidity indicators um, and, and the like, and um, N scores and Z scores. Uh, those of you familiar with those, they're, they're good indicators as to whether or not there's a likelihood of, of financial statement manipulation uh, going on and also financial resiliency issues. So that's the first line, but the, the clients also want us to delve deeper into the organisations themselves. So who are they actually dealing with and who are they owned by? Um, and this organization in particular deals with a lot of suppliers who are held by PE houses. Um, and what they're really interested in is the, the investment and divestment cycle within that world. And so therefore, if there is um, an organization they're working with, which is coming up towards the back end of that cycle, what's the likelihood that that PE controlled um, entity will get divested or sold on or stripped out? And therefore, what might that mean for the strategic direction of our client's relationship with them? Um, and mm -hmm. they've used that in a number of cases to either build resilience or enter into early negotiations just to, to add surety into the supply there. Uh, just flipping down to the bottom one here. Uh, so. Um, as part of the internal governance and, and internal audit um, function within this organisation, um, our team have been providing over the last three or four years um, supplier and contract management uh, reviews. So this is a, a contract heavy business, so they contract out large delivery long term complex contracts on the customer side, but they also rely on third parties and suppliers to, in order to deliver that and enable it. So contract management is a really fundamental part of their business. Um, and so essentially we've been sweeping across their business and um, going around all of the different business unit areas to identify what are your contractual delivery risks, what are your supply chain risks and, and how do you improve your, your governance uh, around those. Um, and then just the, the last two over here, the, the contract compliance and performance. Um, as I said earlier, we, we deal with risk management, but we also deal with value and, and cost management as well. And um, this one here is very much in the latter box. So we deal with a, a major oil and gas client at the moment who, who spends billions and billions of dollars every year um, on third parties and are very concerned about cost leakage throughout that process. So we're, we're part of their internal function where on an annual basis, we'll probably do five or six contracts deep dives to identify value leakage and by extension, um, any contract and commercial management enhancements they need to make internally as a result. And then the final one down there, which is more towards the risk management angle, is around third party anti-bribery audits. So where you can outsource the delivery or, or outsource the provision of, of goods to third parties, you can never outsource your risk and reputation. So part of this is really making sure that the clients are getting on the front foot to get transparency and visibility throughout the supply chain. And in this instance, it's a, a global pharma client, uh, obviously a hugely regulated environment, uh, a lot of concern around third party anti-bribery and corruption. And so we provide the, um, the, the, the transparency audits as a result. Mm. And I think that's pretty much it from our end, isn't it, Rob? Yeah, I mean, I think my, my background's in the technology category and technology spend, I think, for the people in the room, IT is, is enormous. And we, we see a lot of value leakage, especially in, in the IT and uh, telecom space. So the, these are categories where often if you if you lift the bit, lift, lift the lid, and have a look there. There's money to be found. Um, the, the you know the management of these contracts are normally so strategic that they, they do need a focus. And, and and given the themes at the moment, um, you know we're we're seeing that they need more investment and time rather than less. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any questions before we hand over? Anyway, so you, you've got our names. Please please feel free to to drop us an email or. Through LinkedIn or, or through the website, that's um, that's absolutely fine. But thanks for your time, everyone. Uh, so we're handing over to you. Is it back to you? Um, Ollie is. Yeah. Yeah. 
do a classic, uh, classic sketch. Hi, I'm Ollie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> hi, I'm Fiona uh, Raystrick. I'm one of our partners here. Uh, I actually sit in our financial services uh, business, um, uh, but my predominant focus is on economic crime advisory. Uh, so myself and Vlad today are here to talk to you uh, about predominantly economic crime, probably AML, uh, but also the other regulatory compliance regimes that obviously affect you guys. So it may not be relevant to all of you, but most of you are here for the more financial agenda of the day, uh, but equally as important and very high uh, on the priority list. Vlad, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Before we move on? Hi, well, I'm Vlad. I'm the senior manager in the economic crime advisory team. I've been the BEO for just over five years and predominantly I look after the team's sort of technical agenda, so making sure that we are operating at a high standard calibre and that we have our finger on the pulse in terms of what affects the market from an international perspective. Great, so today, um, kind of obvious focus in terms of the areas that are relevant in this space, uh, whilst the uh, gambling uh, betting and gaming uh, sector is obviously affected by lots of regulation. Um, the primary aspects, especially from the UKGC, are in relation to uh, money laundering and also the social responsibility, social responsibility and responsible gambling aspects, uh, which we'll touch on further uh, in a minute. Um, but what I just wanted to do in terms of introduction was, I suppose, remind us all where we are and where the UKGC is in, in this light. Um, so the UKGC has been pretty active for quite a long time. Uh, it suddenly gained some teeth a while back and then suddenly decided to bite lots of people um, and they've not stopped they've continued with that very proactive supervisory approach and almost much more proactive than most of our other UK regulators sometimes putting them to shame uh, in terms of their uh, their the bearing their teeth. Um, we've seen this year, uh, this year, we're now in 24, we've seen in, in 2023 uh, that they've uh, issued the largest record breaking fine, uh, 19.2 million pounds. Uh, let's hope we don't see another one of those, and especially not for any of you in the room during um, 2024. Um, but also, what we've seen uh, with interest is that uh, they're not. Uh, looking kindly on repeat offenders. So we had an instance where a firm was fined and then not that many months later, uh, it was then suspended for continued failure uh, of, of compliance. Um, so I think it's it's critically important, obviously, to get this right in the first instance. But if you don't get it right, it's to get it sorted. And obviously that's something that we help firms with is one, understanding where you're not getting it right, uh, but also understanding where you might be able to get it sorted, how better, quicker, um, uh, with more um, positive engagement with, with the regulator, uh, rather than it being much more of an adversarial uh, arrangement. I am a former financial services regulator and have many dealings uh, with understanding and how and learning how to handle those engagements. And sometimes when we come into firms, we see that actually a lot of the damage, so to speak, is around that relationship management with the regulators to really understand and show that you know what you need to do and you're going to get it fixed in short order and to a high quality. Uh, the other thing that we're also seeing, which I'll come on to a little bit more in a second, uh, when, after Vlad's covered a couple of the core, core topics, is around the shift as well, not away from the remote operator space, but to include the land-based piece as well. So if that's an area that you are in, don't feel that you can breathe a sigh of relief and oh, it's all about the remote operators. They're the ones that make the mistakes. They're the ones that get the big fines. No, it's not always. Uh, and there is more focus and more scrutiny on those land-based businesses as well. Lad. Right, so AML, usually <laughs> AML and financial crime are the, uh, the area where we have the most acronyms, but I think Ollie probably took the paper today with bagpipe and bread. <laughs> Good work. Um, so AML is such a diverse topic, we could really spend all day on it, but what we're going to do today is kind of hone in on a specific area based on the work we've undertaken and we continue to undertake in the space. So the business wide risk assessment, or as it's commonly known, the money laundering risk assessment, the financial crime risk assessment. So a key development to note that happened in 2023 is the release of the Gambling Commission's actual own risk assessment of money laundering and terrorist financing across the industry. So whilst the assessment didn't necessarily uh, lead to any changes in the risk ratings across different gambling sectors, <coughs> what it did unsurprisingly note is that the, the you know, there are many vulnerabilities, risks, typologies to money laundering and terrorist financing 
in the sector. It's a fast moving industry. There's a lot of innovation and change um, with the use of catering to customer needs. And with such a change, there is always the risk of criminals finding new and wonderful ways to launder their illicit funds. And obviously the industry needs to be alert for this and needs to have its finger on pulse. So I guess moving forward from the actual gambling commission's own assessment, the um, licensed positions and codes of practice, i.e. the LCTP, actually advised operators to conduct their own firm-wide assessment of the money laundering and terrorist financing risks of their business. Um, the key thing here is that the aim of, of any, any regulator, and ultimately what a firm should be looking to achieve through this risk assessment process is to understand the actual risks that their business is exposed to based on the size and nature of that business. So there's no point, for example, discussing ad infinitum, a particular risk, if ultimately there is a zero, you know, zero risk appetite or company policy is zero appetite for that risk. So we often see you know, firms going on and on about discussing the risk of PEPs where actually there's zero appetite towards PEPs for that business. So make sure you tailor the risk assessment to what is relevant to your business. Further, the risk assessment isn't a one-off exercise, it is part of the ongoing dynamic risk management framework within business. So that means that it needs to be, the risk assessment needs to be kept under regular review and needs to be updated in line with any changes of circumstances. So for example, the release of any new products or systems or control of processes. Again, moving further into what happened in the year. So for those operators that are in the scope of the money laundering regulations as well as the LCCP, so essentially those that are classified as casinos, Proliferation finance and risk exposure must, now, uh, must also now be considered. So, either in a standalone proliferation finance and risk assessment or as part of a wider money laundering and terrorist finance and risk assessment. Importantly, Regulation 18 of the money, 18A, sorry, the, uh, of the money laundering regs obliges um, operators to consider proliferation finance and risk in the wider context of their customer, geographic, product and service transaction, and delivery channel risk. So, it's important that you look at it across its full spectrum rather than just through a single lens. And finally, the risk assessment really needs to essentially form part of the wider anti money laundering, counter terrorist financing, and counter proliferation financing strategy in place with an operator. There needs to be a clear traceability between the risk assessment and an operator's risk based approach, i.e., the risk assessment needs to inform the overall risk framework and inform the wider AML CTF framework itself. If and where the risk assessment uncovers any changes in either risk exposure or control strength, which ultimately leads to a change in that residual risk position, and there needs to be a clear follow through to risk decision making. Right, so that was our risk stop tour of uh, AML. Right, so social responsibility. So as you see on the screen, we have a quote from uh, Andrew Rhodes of the commission in the CEO briefing. I think if nothing else, the these words should kind of serve as a stark reminder that social responsibility or so, uh, responsible gambling continue to be a huge priority for the Commission and that certainly won't change moving forward. In 2023, the social responsibility space was heavily dominated by events and developments in the remote betting game space. So this time last year, for example, we presented quite a detailed time of events leading to the long-awaited release of the Commission's remote customer interaction guidance. This was finally published in August 23. So the guidance is predominantly structured um, around three key social responsibility outcomes that operators are expected to meet. So identify, act, and evaluate. From our work, we've certainly seen some comprehensive um, efforts to enhance sophistication and the identify component, but often the act and evaluate buckets or pillars do require some further <coughs> work to embed. We've seen, from a, I guess from a market of harm perspective, we've seen different approaches being implemented across the sector for, for dealing and identifying such, um, identifying such markets. So from internally developed tools and software, which uh, leverage big data through to AI, or through to third party software, which is able to learn from data sets. So this often leads to further thinking about things such as thresholds and triggers, whether they should be deposit led or loss led or both, and are they ultimately risk based enough? Operators also need to think about whether such financial triggers and thresholds should be supplemented with actual activity or behaviour based triggers to provide for a much more holistic and much more accurate social responsibility assessment. And finally, affordability. So, this obviously continues to be a huge topic for debate, especially given the kind of ongoing cost of living crisis that everyone's going through. 
So we do see some operators collecting um, information about occupation, supplementing this with um, open source searches to make more informed judgments about disposable income and ultimately customer affordability. It's important um, at this point though to remember that collecting uh, information about occupation does also crop up in the Commission's AML guidance, which can lead to confusion. So operators need to be aware of within their frameworks why occupational information has been collected and through what lens it's going to be assessed. And lastly, we see many of the operators that we're working with turn towards automated checks for affordability, such as through third party tools like TransUnion. Obviously, we welcome this. Um, you know, it's, 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 it only helps to strengthen the framework, but it's important through um, implementing such tools, such automation, to not lose that human overlay, that human component, and therefore expose yourself to an over reliance on numbers that are spat out by machine. Again, back to you. So, last line, I know we're holding you up for a break, um, which <laughs> it in, wait for that coffee. It was almost here. Um, she likes if you need to. Um, so the last slide, we're basically just looking to the future. So what is it actually going to be? What is it at, uh, at 2024 and beyond going to look like? What do you need to be focusing on? What if you haven't already found do you need to start reading and digesting uh, for the coming year? Um, so consultations. Um, there's going to be quite a few. Uh, so we've already last year we had the white paper, um, which was looking at uh, the reform of the, the Gambling Act, uh, you know, long due, uh, obviously a while ago since it was last done. But that's already led to uh, an expectation of a number of consultations. We had one in October, which uh, quite niche, uh, looking at things like multi-operator self-exclusion. Um, but that's already been fed into the RTCP uh, and therefore when we know there's more on the horizon. Uh, we've got a couple of other consultations that are already out there, which are ones closing in February, one in March, um, which are looking at also LCCP more fundamentally uh, and the remote gambling and software technical standards. Uh, picking on things like customer interaction changes, uh, operator control changes, internal structural changes that are all going to be needed uh, on the back of these consultations. So again, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I literally have about two minutes for this, so I'm not going to go into those, but this is a flag to say there is a lot going on. If you think that the compliance space in gambling is pretty static and pretty boring, and especially in relation to AML and RG, absolutely not. There's lots of things that are moving that you need to be aware of. And what we're finding, which is great, is actually firms are being proactive and going, OK, I've kind of read this, I kind of get it, but let's try and have maybe discussions with ourselves, uh, whether we come in and look and do an assessment of well, where you got to in terms of your uh, gap analysis, your roadmap of what you think the implications of these are going to be. So proactivity is definitely the word the day with all of these changes on the horizon. Um, AML reform, so we've obviously already seen uh, SAR reform uh, over the course of last year uh, and the changes that would have uh, caused in terms of your processes etc uh, around, around SARS, um, but we're also expecting um, changes on the back are in relation to the AML and, and, and CTF supervisory approach uh, and supervisory regime, uh, which is likely to affect both UKGC and other UK uh, supervisors, which is obviously FCA, HMRC, uh, you know, the 20 odd uh, professional oversight bodies, etc. So as a result of that, that has a direct consequence to yourselves as regulated businesses. But if you if you are regulated uh, uh, by UKGC for ML, etc. Um, so again, be mindful of that, keep an eye on what the changes are that are coming through on the back of that and trying to predict well, what actually that might that have in terms of an, a, a direct change in the supervisory approach of the UKGC. How do I get ahead of what might be rather than waiting for them to change their approach and their tactics and then suddenly come knocking at your door when you're not ready? So again, it's all about looking uh, forwards. Uh, legislative change, we've got the delights of the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Act 2023. Uh, the biggie from that, I won't go into the detail of it all, but the biggie from that being the failure to prevent fraud, uh, which again, we're already talking to many firms, working with firms uh, to ensure that they have considered the implications of what they need to be documenting, demonstrating, evidencing to make sure they are really in the right space when it comes to the measures that they've taken to prevent fraud. Now, it's not about pure fraud prevention, it's taking the right steps to 
prevents fraud and making sure you've got that really it's massively evidential based and therefore really important that you've got the right control for the right documentation in place. We've also got amendments to the uh, Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Regs 2023, things like the treatment of uh, domestic and international PEPs, which I mean, Vlad was mentioning, that may not be within your appetite anyway, so it may not be relevant, but still be aware what are those changes coming down the line, even things like which may be relevant to some of you, the removal of the gambling advertising from the front of football shirts from the next season. So again, more things coming through, more changes. These legislative documents are huge and it's filtering through it all to get to the bits that actually are relevant and are going to impact you. The last point which I mentioned at the start, but I'll just conclude here, is about that land-based piece and our uh, expectation that there's a more of a shift towards uh, proactive supervisory aspects on land-based versus the remote, which has been a predominant focus. So if it is something that is part of your business model, uh, we've uh, already been doing reviews of physical, um, physical land-based businesses to go out and actually audit in a small a uh, those businesses in terms of the strength of their controls, the compliance at the local level, which you, if you have that in your business, you should already be doing, or your compliance teams should already be doing on a regular basis with or without the supplement of third party services where needed. So lots of change, lots of things to be aware of coming down the line, lots of current and existing scrutiny of uh, the ex existing framework that's in place. So no time for complacency when it comes to compliance or uh, AML and social responsibility. So don't stop, keep going, it's all good stuff. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Marie. So we've... Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I'm Daisy Bortflower. I sit here in our corporate international tax team in London, and I'm going to be kicking off um, the tax segment of this talk session. Um, and we're starting with um, a focus on some direct tax issues that we hope are interesting and relevant to everyone. I'll be kicking off, but then passing over um, to Paul Daly, who's leading on the transfer pricing side. Carrie, who's from our innovation team, and will be talking a bit about reliefs available. Um, and then on to Chris Evans, who will be giving us um, a variety of direct tax figures. So to start with, um, I'm picking up on the OECD Pillar 2 rules. Um, and I'm conscious that some of you will have attended this event uh, in previous years, and I'm also mindful we seem to be talking about this every year. But the reason for that is it's, it's huge in terms of impact from an international tax perspective. Um, and where we are now in January 2024, um, in a number of jurisdictions, the rules are now in effect for periods beginning on or after 31st of December 23. So it's much more real, it's much more live, and we also have a lot more in terms of available information and insight to share. So we're picking it up again. Um, just as a, a brief recap, or for anyone that's not aware of these rules, um, they're seeking to bring in a global minimum effective tax rate of 15%, and with that almost applying on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. Um, in terms of who's in scope, um, this is for multinational groups with annual consolidated revenues um, of 750 million euros or more, and that test supplies looking at, you know, a, um, a look back period and applying for two of the preceding four years. And um, we're anticipating that a, a number of groups in this audience will be falling into that scope. Um, in terms of how the rules work, um, there's, there's, there's different ways for this. The, the main rule is what's called the income inclusion rule, um, and that's seeking to bring in the 15% by way of a top-up tax, and that top-up tax is picked up and reported by the ultimate parent entity in the group. There's then a secondary backstop rule, the undertaxed um, profits rule, and that's uh, kicking in if there's a reason why that main rule in the parent jurisdiction is not fully being applied. Um, I think what's interesting for this is a number of the jurisdictions that we commonly see feature in this sector are not yet bringing in that income inclusion rule. So depending on group structures, there's then does the um, does the top up tax then fall to another entity in the group? And that's what the undertax profits rule addresses. 
Um, there are exemptions and safe harbours. Um, a, a key point to note is what's called the QDMTT, the Qualifying Domestic Top-Up Tax. Um, jurisdictions are, if they bring in their own kind of top-up, 15% top-up tax, um, and that falls in line with the OECD rules, um, any kind of top-up tax in the parent jurisdiction will then not apply. Again, interestingly for this sector, a number of the jurisdictions we're familiar with, like um, Malta and Gibraltar, have not yet brought in a QDMTT. Um, there are also various safe harbours that can be considered. Um, I think it's just worth noting these are uh, relatively narrow in application. For example, we've got on the screen um, the de minimis revenue and profit safe harbour, and actually I mean, the, the 10 million revenue threshold and 1 million profit is not particularly high, but um, these safe harbours are available um, and should be considered. Um, I kind of think as an overriding point, um, in in principle, the idea of a top up tax to get to a minimum 15% tax rate sounds quite simple, but um, the, the calculations required to get to that position and to calculate, calculate that top up tax um, are extremely detailed um, and complex from a technical perspective. We could spend probably the whole day uh, delving into the detail, which frankly we're not going to do, but I did want to give a bit of a plug for um, our webinar series that we're running on this at the moment. So for anyone that does want uh, more of the specific detail, we've got this and I think Ollie, you said we're sending the slides around, so um, you'll have the link to that webinar if you want it. Um, I've touched on this a bit already, um, but thinking about kind of what these rules mean for the for the sector and the jurisdictions we commonly see. This slide is looking to give a snapshot of where everyone is in terms of implementation. Um, this is as at the end of uh, December. The UK and a large number of the EU member states um, have all brought in legislation and have implemented these rules for periods beginning on or after December 23. So we're there. Um, for the other jurisdictions, you'll see that actually um, there's a there's a lot of kind of delay going on. Um, Gibraltar and the, the Crown Dependency Territories um, are delaying and we're not expecting to see anything on this until at least um, the end of the year or next year. Um, Malta is a, a really interesting one. They've announced an intention to implement, but are doing so on a delayed basis. And I think are very much taking a kind of wait and see approach um, and uh, have also uh, made the noise about bringing in a, a new tax uh, credit regime that may help to counteract um, some of the impacts of the, the top up tax. And in terms of what this means for, for groups, if you have entities in these jurisdictions, just because these territories are not bringing in the rules yet doesn't mean there's nothing to consider. Um, as I was talking through the, the way the rules work, there is the ability for the top up tax to be collected in another jurisdiction. And how that operates will really very much depend on your specific root structure. And definitely, if you're not already doing so, something uh, to be thinking about up front. Um, and then kind of wider points to think about with Pillar 2. I think first and foremost, really important if you, you think you're in scope to be thinking about what this means from an impact and compliance perspective. We're really recommending groups do initial impact assessments, think about whether there's safe harbours available and also taking the time to understand what this will mean from a reporting perspective and in you know understanding in which jurisdictions you'll, you'll need to do disclosures or report. Um, if you're in a scenario where you are not going to end up with any top up tax, that also doesn't mean there's nothing to do. There's still the need to do the detailed calculations to, to be able to support that position. Um, and I also wanted to mention, we're finding a lot of businesses want to talk to us about technology solutions for, for addressing compliance. I think the data collation piece is really big um, and something that can be useful if you're thinking about how you're going to manage this in practice. Um, the other area that is important, not necessarily tax um, itself, but um, related to tax, is the accounts disclosure. Ollie talked a bit earlier about um, the, the changes to IAS 12, um, and the key point to, to note is there are disclosure requirements um, in relation to the Pillar 2 impact, if you're in scope, that's under IFRS and FRS 102. Um, and 
that's going to include quantitative and quantitative disclosures and also the the need to include those disclosures and assess the impact for accounts purposes will come in before any reporting from a tax perspective. So another reason why it's so important, I think, to be getting ahead in understanding what the impact is and what that means from a numbers perspective, because you are going to have to pick that up um, in your next set of financial statements. Um, and then another area I think is particularly interesting for Pillar 2 is how this might give us new challenges and considerations when it comes to M&A activity. So if you're buying or disposing of something, does that mean you're going to come inside or fall outside um, that 750 million revenue threshold to be in scope of the rules? And I think something to always have in the forefront, depending on where you are around that revenue threshold. Um, from a due diligence perspective, say for example, you're buying uh, a business that's being carved out of a group that is already in scope for Pillar 2, you've, you've now got to think about diligencing. Has that entity been historically compliant with the rules once they come in? Um, and what does that mean from a risk perspective? And we're doing quite a lot of interesting thinking on our side at the moment around what this all looks like from a, an SPA protection perspective. What do you know? It's a completely kind of new tax and new landscape for warranty and indemnity protections. And I think the key point will be making sure that any SPA protections can sufficiently cover risks around these new rules. Um, and then just as a, a final point on this, there's obviously the impact of Pillar 2 on an effective tax rate for a business. So whether that's a target business or an enlarged group post acquisition, definitely be thinking about whether Pillar 2 applies and what that looks like for cash tax rates, effective tax rates, and how does that impact modelling and future value? Um, as everyone's been saying uh, throughout today, um, we're kind of doing a bit of a quick run through and more than happy to pick up any of these topics um, in more detail later today or after the event. Um, and then just finally for me, whilst we've been talking about the, the complexity and the potential extra tax costs of Pillar 2, we wanted to share some that's more positive news that came out of the 2023 autumn statement in the UK. The first is around the UK ORIP legislation um, and very quickly um, this applies 20% income tax in the UK to offshore companies that are generating revenues from, um, from the exploitation of IP in the UK market. Um, when I stood here 12 months ago, I shared that um, we were seeing a lot of HMRC inquiries for ORIP in this sector. Um, the good news is the autumn statement has announced that these rules are being repealed and that's going to come in um, for income after 31st of December 24. Given um, the ORIP rules uh, widely drawn, carry lots of uncertainty, and there has been the HMRC uh, inquiry focus on this for the sector. We see the, the repeal of the root rules um, being positive news, and I think it's welcome. Um, but I guess one thing to keep in mind is though the, the removal of the ORIP rules is coming in tandem with um, the introduction of the Pillar 2 rules. HMRC's view is that um, the Pillar 2 rules will be much more effective um, in tackling offshore structures. I think we'll perhaps wait and see what it means for this sector. I'm aware of a number of businesses that have been large enough to be in scope of ORIP, but will not be large enough um, to be in scope of Pillar 2. So I think it's one to see how this plays out. Um, and then finally, um, just a bit on capital allowances, because I know I think we've got some land-based operators um, in the audience. Um, Full expensing, which is the ability to claim 100% first year allowance on qualifying plant and machinery assets has been made permanent. That gives a cash tax saving of up to 25p per £1 invested in qualifying assets. So a real incentive um, to be investing in new plant and machinery. And I think good to be aware of if you are looking to fit out a new site or refit an existing site. Um, whilst HMRC are being generous making this uh, 
this this relief permanent and um, that generosity is somewhat balanced by what we're seeing in terms of a lot more HMRC inquiries into capital allowances over the last 12 months um, and these inquiries have been quite granular in terms of requests for details sometimes almost painfully so um, but it's a good reminder that if you are making a sizable capital allowance claims do ensure that those are accurate and you've got the backup support you know, to evidence the spend and that it's on new and unused assets. Um, so that's all that for me, I'm going to pass over to Paul. All right, thank you, Daisy. Good morning, everyone. So very pleased to have opportunity to speak with you all today. So as Daisy said, I am a transfer pricing specialist, so I'm a partner leading the UK transfer pricing team, and I do a lot of work in the sector, so I enjoy working with operators in the B2B uh, providers. So you'll be pleased to hear I've only got one slide, four points, but actually there's a common theme I think threading uh, through these points. So Daisy's talked a lot about pillar two, and that is part of uh, what has been informally known as BEPS 2.0. So transfer pricing has very much been informed by BEPS 1.0, which was concluded in 2015, which now feels like ancient history. Why am I talking about this? Well, I'm talking about this because what we're seeing in the world of transfer pricing is something that I've been thinking of as a quality ratchet. So year on year, as uh, internal and external stakeholders within businesses are becoming more familiar with the concept and the application of transfer pricing. So we are seeing the focus and the intensity on quality increasing. And that's across the board. So from how it is that you disclose, but also how it is that you analyze the back pattern and situation to be able to get to an appropriate and compliance outcome. So it's a consistent theme. It's not isolated to any particular territory. And I'll talk about a couple of territories and what they're doing in terms of the compliance environments as we go through this. But there's a rising tide, I think, of expectation as to what we do around transfer pricing. And we're certainly seeing internal and external stakeholders uh, coming very focused on this. So two external stakeholders in particular that I am seeing more of. So tax authorities, which is probably uh, no great surprise, but also auditors. So statutory auditors are increasingly really digging into transfer pricing and, and asking the right questions to really understand what's going on here. Is this a, a compliance and robust position? So as part of that, on a quality ratchet, if you like. We are seeing the use of profit splits regularly within multinational groups in the sector. And the reason for that is a couple fold. So one reason is that we know that tax authorities uh, can challenge one-sided methods. So one-sided method is you say, right, I'll pick a service provision or a particular part of the business. I'll test that, I'll get to the answer on that. And then the balance must be somewhere else. So tax authorities can often challenge that because they worry about, well, is that an accurate capturing of really how value is created by the group as a whole? So profit split is a way of counterbalancing that because profit split looks at, well, how does the group create value? What are the components of that? And then how do you allocate out that value across the value generating entity? So it creates more transparency, more understanding of how the individual parts relate to the whole. And it is also a helpful method in that it can work where it's difficult to run the pin down through attaching to third party pricing a particular service or access to IP. So we see lots of profit splits within the sector. Many of you um, with your, within your transfer pricing models might be operating uh, along those lines or facing questions um, around the use of profit splits. So suffice to say that it's still a very important and popular method for multinational groups in the sector. So the focus on implementation, again, consequence of this, this uh, intensity around quality. 
So there's one thing to have worked out well, what is the appropriate arm's length pricing, and then there's another thing to translate that year on year into a consistent and accurate transacting of that to arrive at the results that you were intending. So many of our clients within the sector and across the board are really now asking more questions around implementation. And we badge that as operational transfer pricing. And there are really three components to that. So there's the organizational component. So do you know in an organization who's doing what? Because transfer pricing is not just the concern of a tax function. It's also the concern of the finance function who will often be transacting um, the, 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 the ways of um, charging for, for services or IP. It also overlaps into the business as well because the way decisions are made, the location and the, 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 the patterns of travel by senior executives can also um, play into where is it that we recognise the problem methods will be built on an understanding of this is what the business does so we need to keep pace with actually what is happening in the business and how is that being conducted and the last part of operational transfer pricing really really important are inter uh, intercompany contracts so the intra-group contracts and there was a, a time in transfer pricing where you do some benchmarking and you pull a, a report together and, and that was it you, you're done but now there's a lot more focus on the agreements themselves, but also really crucially the alignments of those agreements to the business reality. Last but not least, and this is a consequence, I think, of that, that focus on transfer pricing is we're seeing more documentation requirements come into play and we're seeing more uh, transfer pricing regimes coming online. So just to mention two uh, today. So the first is the UK. So we are now for most businesses, um, those over 750 million euros for those businesses, we're now into the mandatory documentation regime. So it's for businesses over 750 million euros with a cross-border transaction with a period beginning on or after 1 April 2023. So for those of you with a December year end, 1st of January, that's the first period that there is a mandatory UK requirements. If you don't maintain the records in the manner that is set out by the law, then potentially subject to penalties. The records are in the form of a master file and a local file, which many groups are already keeping. Um, but if you haven't and you meet the threshold, you are now legally required to do so. HMRC have been very clear that even if you don't meet the threshold, they view master file and local file now as best in common practice and if you produce it in a different format you may well uh, face questions as to why that is. Um, the second one very quickly so Malta uh, has uh, kicked off its regs or rather um, 1st of Jan for basis periods beginning at that point and now within the uh, Maltese regime and that will translate through into being able to support the position and master file and local file will come into play there as well. So I'll leave it at that to say that really what we are seeing is the kind of the tightening up of expectation around transfer pricing. It's across the board and it's something that really benefits from you know some good attention, not just at the end of the period looking back to say, right, OK, what have we done? Let's document that but also um, keeping on top of it through the year and making sure that the operational aspects align with the policy intent. OK, so that's me done. Uh, I'm now handing over to Carrie. Lovely to meet everybody. Um, so I'm Carrie Rutland. I'm a partner in the Innovations Incentives team at BDO. Um, and I'm going to spend the next five minutes or so just talking about innovation incentives in this sector um, and primarily R&D tax relief um, and why you should sort of be rethinking it at the moment. Um, and R&D tax relief is the main incentive available to betting and gaming companies because the creative reliefs and video games relief don't apply if there's a gambling element to it. Um, so I'm going to look at three areas. One, talking about optimising your R&D claims, in particular, in light of the changes that are coming down the line. Um, 
avoiding HMRC pitfalls and then just touch at the end on the global picture. So if we think about R&D tax relief in the UK at the moment, there is a massive swathe of reform that's going on. Um, it started in August with the implementation of an additional information form, and it's carrying on all the way through up to sort of 24, 25. Um, so one of the things that happened um, from 1st of April 23 is the rate of R&D relief was um, increased. Um, that's partly in line with the increase in corporation tax rates, but partly because innovation is a key area of, that the government wants to encourage. So the rate of um, relief has gone up to 20%. In terms of a um, net benefit after tax, that's 15% um, rate of relief. So your qualifying spend, 15% of it you can get as cash back or as a tax saving. Um, prior to the 1st of April, it was 10.5%. So you can see quite a sizable increase. Um, the other thing that people come and ask me quite often is they've heard that overseas costs no longer qualify for R&D tax relief. That is coming, but it's not there yet. So it comes from accounting periods beginning on or after 1st of April 24. So if you're a December year end company, you've still got the time and you can claim for worldwide development costs that are recharged back to the UK. So you have two years from the end of the accounting period to make an R&D claim, so you can still claim for 22, 23, 24. So three years of overseas costs. So yes, think about it for the future, but not something to worry about immediately. Uh, the other planning point on overseas costs, when they do go, if you have a branch of a UK company, um, you can still include overseas branch costs. So a number of companies are actually thinking about, do I employ my new developers in a branch of the UK legal entity or do I um, employ them in a subsidiary? It's just something to be aware of. That's not anti-avoidance. We've had very open discussions with HMRC about overseas branches. Um, they're quite comfortable that they continue to be included because actually they like the transparency of seeing the branch figures and the branch information. Um, the other change that's coming in, and you'll see everything's got a different date, which is really unhelpful. Um, from 1st of April 23, is we've got additional cost categories brought into the regime. Um, this is HMRC trying to get up to date with actually what's, what's happening in the tech space. So cloud computing costs, data, pure maths. So if you're doing any mathematical modeling, sort of um, calculating odds or anything that actually just sits in sort of Excel macros and isn't um, necessarily in the uh, software, you can also claim for those costs. Um, so just make sure that when you're doing your R&D claims, you're thinking about all your teams and, and all your cost base. Um, AWS has historically been a sort of a complete minefield where HMRC going, all AWS costs don't qualify. Um, with the introduction of cloud computing and actually some cloud hosting costs, um, AWS costs, which are often a really big cost for the business, will now come into R&D claims. So that's a bit of the sort of the good news on UK R&D tax relief. Um, at the same time, um, HMRC is worried that people are abusing the regime. And they've identified 1.3 billion of fraud in it. Um, and I've seen some um, sort of dodgy R&D claims that have gone in and they are eye-wateringly bad. Um, so the key here is to distinguish your R&D <laughs> from the eye-wateringly bad ones. Um, and that comes down to um, the documentation you provide to HMRC through the additional information form. So the additional information form was introduced on the 8th of August um, 23. It states the number of technical narratives that you need to provide and the um, costing information in your R&D claim. And interestingly, the R&D advisor you have used to help prepare the R&D claim um, because they know there are some advisors that they, they see a lot of sort of bad claims from. So just really make sure that you, you're comfortable with your claim, you take ownership of it yourself, and you ask any advisory questions about it so you really understand what they're doing. I mean, it's not just them preparing the claim. Um, inquiries are painful, very, very painful. Um, I had a company who came to me on Thursday last week. HMRC had sent them a 12-page letter on the 22nd of December, so happy Christmas, um, and said, I want all this information by the 22nd of January. 
the guy didn't get the letter until day, um, last Thursday and had three weeks to reply. Um, so if you get an inquiry letter, take professional advice um, because there are some bits in there where they ask for signed witness statements that aren't in the legislation, aren't in the guidance and actually are sort of, you don't need to provide them. They're a bit of a, a trap. So make sure before you respond that you get some, that you take some advice. Um, there's a disclosure facility that may well be um, introduced. And again, that comes with the same sort of health warnings. Um, so very much UK is open for business, encouraging R&D, but just make sure you comply with the rules and regulations. Um, when overseas costs go from the R&D regime, think globally. Most OECD countries have an R&D regime and also want to encourage um, innovative companies. Um, and plan, look at where you want to establish your R&D centres. Um, compare and contrast the R&D re um, reliefs that you can obtain. Um, and then put the people in the right location if you've got that ability. Um, there are some interesting nuances in the R&D regime. Most have the same definition of R&D, so advancing science or technology, resolving technical challenges. But some countries like South Africa, you have to get pre-approval for projects. Others, you need to make the claim within 12 months. Some you have to notify <coughs> within six months of the year end. Everyone's got its own nuance. So just make sure you're up to speed with that. Um, we have a, a global incentive sort of, you can click on a country and it will tell you edited highlights of what, um, what reliefs are available. So just check it out. Um, but um, there is the potential to significantly reduce your tax liability I mean, in a totally compliant manner um, through these reliefs. So just make sure you're making the most of them. Okay, so I will pass on to Chris and Martin Dunnett. Hello everyone, um, I'm Chris Evans. I'm a director in the Indirect Tax Team. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about indirect tax, um, starting up, I guess, globally, um, and then zooming down a little bit into more UK centric matters. Um, so this changes every year, um, but I figure it's a, give a little bit of a flavour of what's going on in the world for point of consumption taxes, starting with the good news, which is Brazil legalised gambling as of uh, 31st of December, 30th of December, a few weeks ago. Um, and their tax rate is actually, on first glance, not too bad. Um, 12% um, on effectively operator winnings, operator profits. Um, obviously, that is going to get more complex as guidance comes in, as a state and federal and local <coughs> law also takes effect. But 12% is certainly lower than it started um, and actually quite good. Um, the other things to consider in Brazil are uh, establishment rules. So you need to have a Brazilian established and incorporated <coughs> company to be an operator there. Um, and at the moment, there is no uh, exemption from local indirect taxes. Brazil has notoriously the most complicated indirect tax regime in the world, which is moving to a VAT in four, five, ten years, sometime in the future. Um, so whilst you uh, gambling handling tax looks pretty reasonable, um, it's going to be more complicated and probably higher than most headline numbers would tell you. Um, moving on to medium, slightly negative news. Um, Sweden's gambling tax rates going up middle of this year. Uh, July, I think, um, from 18 to 22 percent. So it's broadly in the same sort of range as you see in most of Europe, um, absent the UK, with an asterisk we'll get to shortly. Um, and in the worst news, um, Indian GST, middle of October last year, I think it was, um, they, Gulf, the Council of Ministers confirmed that they would see more gambling as of its 20 percent, 8 percent tax rate, and that tax rate is on deposits taken, so not on uh, operating profits, no deduction for winnings. Um, as I'm sure and many people who've been de dealing with India have um, seen a lot of people turning off in India because that tax rate is just, it's not economic to operate. So you have good news, moderate news and bad news, and I expect pretty much the same this year as well. Including in the UK. Um, so this is an announcement from budget um, that the UK will be having a consultation on online gambling. Um, and it was, I think, phrased as uh, trying to harmonise the online uh, tax rates, online gambling tax rates. Um, at the moment, 15% for pool betting duty, 15% for general betting duty, 21% for remote gaming duty. So obviously gaming tax more than betting. Um, the assumption, I think for most people, including Ollie in his earlier presentation, is that harmonization will go in only one way, um, which I think is probably fair. 
Um, but probably the bigger questions to be asked on this consultation, which is this is pretty much all detail we have at the moment. Um, so we're expecting an actual consultation paper out shortly, um, possibly as part of the March um, budget. Um, two big questions I think we have are the timeline, which um, we have heard it's meant to become effective. The changes might become effective from April 2027. Um, you'll see that's quite a long way away for what's probably not that much of a change, um, given they're all basically the same law already, just slightly different rates. Um, and you certainly think that an incoming government, perhaps not, not the government we have at the moment, searching around for tax to fund their spending priorities, may want to upgrade that timeline a little bit, um, as well as uh, possibly go 21%, possibly go higher. Um, I think it's generally the view in government at the moment, as far as I understand it, is that the 21% for remote gaming duty has not been uh, has not come with much channelization away from the um, the, the legitimate market. Um, they see it's pretty much a success. Um, so I don't think there's a huge amount stopping them going higher than 21% across the board, especially if it's decoupled from betting shops and jobs in betting shops more relevantly, um, which is where that um, will go to have a single online tax. Um, so yes, yeah, so you have some weird things then in terms of different tax rates for the same product, the same bet in the shop, probably will be tax less than the same product in online. But that's probably alongside the government's real, de real regulatory um, direction of channel as well. Um, the other big question on this is how they will treat um, promotional um, games, promotional activities, promotional mechanisms. Um, because at the moment, betting duty, it's pretty simple. Um, you just, whatever you get, you get free bet, you pay tax on the free bet. RGD is significantly more complicated. Um, I'll just go into a bit more detail on that on the next slide. Um, but there's a question about whether the UK will what the UK legislation will try and change to take account of promotional activities, or there might just be a policy of trying to move towards general betting duty, a policy of just taxing everything. Um, if indeed they want to discourage promotional activities, for, again, from a regulatory and tax standpoint, they could very clearly, very easily sort of get rid of churn, if you like, if by pay paying tax every time you pay, um, uh, make a gaming payment with churn conditions, that's just not going to work anymore. Um, other policy changes. So DCMS actually levy consultation, um, that is still under consultation within DCMS at the moment, uh, likely to be 1% of uh, operated profits to fund research, education and treatment. Um, the interesting thing about that is that it doesn't just apply to operators, it applies B2B, so it really follows the licence rather than most taxes where it follows if you apply to consumers or not. And finally, um, there is still some engagement on what they call the future of VAT, um, which is across the entire VAT system. Um, but in particular, um, questions about whether it makes sense to have the exemption for VAT, also exemption from VAT for gambling. Um, some people have made comments about why are we exempting it, put that on it, it's not a public good, why are we taking away tax? Not quite understanding the point of all the gambling duties right there. Um, but also there are other opportunities that I know some people in this room actually probably have been putting forward, um, such as a zero rate for gambling, which would pretty much upend a lot, a lot of the structuring the Maltese and Gibraltar structures in place at the moment. Obviously a huge change. I can't imagine public publicly very popular so giving um, gambling companies a, a, a tax a tax relief, um, but it would be an interesting thing to consider. So now on to HMRC and compliance activity. So we've seen um, HMRC really, really, really dislike promotional activity. Um, they disliked it in the land based sector. Uh, in terms of casinos, cashbacks, um, non-negs, taking the number of cases on that. Um, and they really dislike it now in remote gaming as well. So they have been attacking a number of operators on a number of different levels, uh, on a number of different fact patterns. Um, often not the same fact pattern gives a different answer, and often the two or three different inquiries are using different points to get to the same answer. So it's not necessarily a consistent policy, but as a headline, I would say HMRC at the moment do not like promotional offers. Um, that mainly includes, the big one includes sort of uh, when you start off, you have an account and then you spin a wheel to get something um, initially or add an offer as a weekly offer or something like that. I don't like that and I can kind of see their points on that if that can be used in more or less aggressive ways. But the one that we have that's really crashing our heads is in play features. So this is where I start playing a game and I get three um, apples on a slot machine and it takes me to another, another game, a bonus wheel. So I've not put in any money, I've not taken out any money, and I can't do either of those two things. It's all part of the same game, 
all part of the same game for RTP purposes, it's certified at that RTP. Um, but HMRC see that second bonus round as being a separate game subject to duty under the RGD free play rules. And we, we have a couple of clients where there are quite long discussions about this. We can't see where they're coming from. We really can't. Um, but they have taken the policy a couple of times, um, they've escalated it. We've talked to the person who's dealing with it who's not policy, because policy won't talk to us at the moment. Um, but they seem to want um, tax on that bonus stake. Um, we think they're wrong multiple times over, I guess. Um, but if what we have heard from them as well is that they, because obviously within the game this is not valued, and there's no way to get the information of how much that stake is, because I don't think anyone did, because is it actually part of the game. Um, they are taking a very loose approach to best judgment essence, uh, mentioning the one we've heard is 0.75% turnover on that game. So that's not profit, that's just turnover, so stakes put in, um, which can lead some very, very big figures. Um, we've not seen an assessment raised on that basis yet. That's just a discussion with HMRC, um, but I know that is where they seem to be going. Um, and they have mentioned that they have raised estimates on other operators that we've not had sight of on that basis. So, yeah, that's one that's really interesting over the next year. Um, if HMRC continue, I imagine that something will go to tribunal. Um, and I know the BGC is also aware of this and talking amongst themselves. So from my point of view, I suppose, is just if this is happening to you um, and you are being assessed on this basis, um, I'd certainly recommend talking to the BGC or us um, because the last thing we want is a poorly argued case taking this because it is really quite a significant amount of tax at stake if this is applied across the sector. I can't see how it would, I can't technically how it would, um, but that's the decision HMRC are taking um, and that's the decision you've got to be aware of. Um, cool, I think that is all done. Bang on 12, it's almost like we planned it. <laughs> Um, so just just uh, as I say, if there are any questions, I think, as I said, there's, um, I think most of the presenters will be around for those in the room. If there's anybody online with questions, um, I think it's probably slightly easier just to get, get in touch with us afterwards. We're more than happy to, to answer any of those. Um, just a couple of quick thank yous. Thank so thank you to everyone for, for, for attending, both online and uh, in person. I think we'll continue to do this sort of hybrid event because it <clears throat> obviously gives some of our own sort of international uh, clients and, and contacts an opportunity to attend as well and then finally just thank you to all of our uh, speakers for, for today and um, we have got to say some lunch and stuff next door so please do please do hang around and um, yeah enjoy the rest of the day and the weekend